Hi, I'm Rob Carolina. This is one part of a multi-part introduction to the Law and Regulation Knowledge Area of CYBOC. The Law and Regulation Knowledge Area is one of 19 knowledge areas in the entire project. The webinar that introduces this knowledge area is pretty long, and so I decided to break it up into 15 constituent parts. You are now about to listen to one of those parts. If you haven't already done so, I would recommend that you go back and listen to the introduction. It's also labeled Part Zero. That'll help you understand what's about to happen. Alternatively, you can listen to the entire webinar as a single file. So without further ado, let's listen to this part. Let's look now at the law of contract. Contract describes a legal relationship between persons. The simplest definition I've found is a contract is a promise or a series of promises that the law will enforce. Contract does not describe a piece of paper. This often causes confusion where people get focused on the paper, the signature. No, the contract is the relationship. And finally, as an introductory comment on contract, at least in common law systems, remember that only someone who is a party to a contract normally has the right to enforce that contract against another party. We call this the rule of privity. This becomes important, especially if you're going to look at trust services and trying to figure out how to use contract mechanisms to rationalize liability. I wanted to take a slightly different approach in this webinar to the way that the subject matter is laid out in CYBOC. So if you look at CYBOC, you'll find a discussion of contracts in an online environment for people who have to design secure online trading platforms. And you'll find a legal discussion about warranties and exclusion of warranties and limitations of liability, uh, breach of contract and remedies, and conflicts of law, of course. The thing I want to focus on in this webinar is using contract to encourage security behaviors. So when we talk about using contract to encourage security behaviors, whose behavior are we talking about? Very often I find it boils down to one of two types of person, either someone in a supply chain relationship, or we're talking about participants in a trading or a payment system. What types of contract mechanisms are used? The simple ones, promises to comply with security standards, or promises to notify in the event of incidents, to grant audit rights, and similar things. You get the idea. What's actually at risk, though, where these contracts are concerned? If a party is going to breach one of these promises, if they break one of these promises, what do they have at risk? Well, the highest risk in breaking these promises might be the loss of the value of a trade or the value of a payment. This is the case where people are participating in a trading platform or a payment system. In terms of medium or lower risk, what does a party face if they break their word? That might be a loss of relationship. They could be facing a legal action for breach of contract. Are those really effective threats? Or put differently, how significant is the influence that those mechanisms are going to have? Why is it that there are limits on the ability of a contract to influence behavior? In short, it may be that breaching a contract doesn't cost very much. This could be because of a low quantum of provable loss. It might be that a disappointed party isn't willing to bring a legal action. There might be technical problems involving privity or something else. It could be that a party can't prove that a security violation caused a financial loss. Consider, for example, all the cases of breach notification. Someone gets a breach notification from a given organization. Three months later, they're the victim of identity theft. Can they really demonstrate on the balance of probabilities that the identity theft was caused by that particular loss of data? That's going to be hard. There might be other legal reasons why liability is limited. It could be limitations and exclusions imposed in the contract itself. Finally, in the supply chain example, it could be that a party is unwilling to pursue action because they have no credible alternative source of supply. This is a very common problem in outsourcing. I suggest 
that the ability of a contract to influence behavior is dependent on the subject matter of the contract itself. So if security is a foundation in reducing some much larger commercial risk, the contract will probably have a strong influence over behavior. The best example I can think of would be contracts within payment systems. A failure to comply with security measures means that a party might risk losing the entire value of a trade or of merchandise that's been delivered. Areas where the contract might have a medium influence would be those where security is the subject matter of other goods or services supplied. If a vendor is supplying security devices or security services to a sophisticated customer, they have a very strong incentive to try and comply with contract terms. But even here, they will have some flexibility for negotiation or certainly an opportunity to try to make things better if something goes wrong. The vast majority of contracts, I suspect, will fall into this last category where the contract is having only a weak influence over security behaviors. This is because the subject matter of the contract is not necessarily security itself. We're talking here about supply of routine software and hardware, cloud services, other goods and services. Security might be an encouraged feature. It might be an encouraged behavior, but it's not the core subject matter of the contract. And a party delivering goods and services in those circumstances will know this. They'll know this when they negotiate, and they'll know this during the operational phase of the contract relationship. And because of the limitations discussed in the last slide, a counterparty will realize that the cost of breaking their security promises might be very low. Let's have a look at the